Hello and welcome to worship with Beverly Baptist Church. For those who don't know me, my name is Phil and I'll be leading our worship today. Julie and another Phil will be leading our song worship and Steph will be speaking to us as we continue our series looking at the first letter of Peter. We come to worship God the one who is seated on the throne of heaven and rules in absolute power, justice and love over all that he has made. As we begin our worship, we declare again how great he is and how small we are by comparison. As we sing, Behold our God.
Let us pray. Lord, you are the sovereign God, the one who reigns as king of the universe, king of this world. And Lord, you do not do so as a tyrant, nor as one who is indifferent, but as one who loves and cares for all your creation a God of grace and love. Lord, we confess that we do not always understand how that works. We see things happening in this world and they don't seem fair. We want to question you. We want to tell you that we have a better way of doing things. Lord, forgive us. Give us peace and rest in the knowledge of your love. Help us to be patient when we don't understand, particularly perhaps at this time when there are still many things that are uncertain and upsetting going on around us. Help us to see you as the God on the throne, but also the God on the cross. Jesus, who suffers with us and for us, and in that to know that you understand and share our experience of pain. Help us to trust you, even when our faith seems to be being torn beyond its limits. Lord, we thank you for the signs that you are at work in this world. We have prayed often for an end to this pandemic, be that by miraculous means or medical. And perhaps the two are not so far apart. Because we thank you that for a virus for which some questioned whether there would ever be a vaccine, we now have so many options for effective vaccines. We thank you for graphs that are all going the right way case numbers, death figures, numbers in hospital, all declining at rapid rates and showing no signs of slowing down. We thank you. And we pray for your continued hand on our route out of this time of lockdown and into a future of hope. That quicker than many of us dared to imagine, this might all be firmly behind us. And Lord, whatever happens for the future, because if we've learned anything over these past 12 months is that we don't know what the future holds. But we believe that you do. And so help us to walk into the future trusting you, holding firmly to the hope that you have given us in Jesus. Help us to live out the calling which you have given to us to be your people of light in the darkest places, with a message of hope in times of despair. For we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm really looking forward to the time in the hopefully not too distant future when we have lots of notices again. But there are a couple of things to mention. Our Crunchy Fairies are still active. If you have a birthday or an anniversary coming up, please make sure Karen knows about it and she'll pass the message on to make sure that they deliver you some chocolate. I understand they managed to deliver a Crunchy four months early to someone this week. Even the Crunchy Fairies are not infallible. I think this week extra celebrations, though possibly not extra crunchies, for parents and children as the schools reopen. I know you're all looking forward to meeting your friends again and we pray that it goes really well for you this week. And we pray for parents who might now get a bit more rest and headspace or ability to focus on their own work. We're not allowed to get 
new children and young people together again for church activities yet. We will do so as soon as we can. Hopefully the 12th of April uh, is the date on which that will become possible again. So as soon as we can after that, we will try to get you together in some way. But if you're watching this service as it goes out live on Sunday 7th of March, 11.15 this morning, an opportunity for our children to gather on Zoom to catch up with one another. It's the same link as our normal Sunday coffee, uh, which will follow on at 11.30 as normal. So 11.15, any children, young people who are around and would like to just come on, say hello, very informal and unstructured, just a chance to see each other and to catch up. Uh, you'd be very welcome and it would be lovely to see you there. We continue in worship of our God who is on the throne, who is a God of mercy and love and compassion, who is a God who loves it when we worship him, loves to hear us singing his praises, loves to bless us as we gather by the power of his spirit. And so we're going to spend some time in worship of God now. Julie and Phil are going to lead us as we sing.
could remember no wrongs we had done. Omniscient, all knowing, he counts not the sun. Frode is to a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the
We're going to come now to a time of prayer and I want to begin by sharing some fantastic news from this week. After a lot of time and effort from members of our congregation and from our solicitor who was sending me messages at half past midnight last Sunday morning, we have signed the lease on the Armstrong's building. As of Wednesday we are legally the tenants there. I'll be collecting the keys this coming Tuesday. There's been a lot of efforts to bring this phase to completion, but there is a sense in which this is only the beginning of the journey. We're now moving ahead with plans for refurbishment and alterations. We'll be consulting on those and at some point in the next few weeks, we will have a church meeting to sign off on the expenditure. And alongside and around those plans, we will be beginning to use the building for our own purposes, to meet at four times of worship, to meet with our children as we're able, and also continuing to put things in place for wider community use from the summer. So there's still lots to do. And I'm really excited to see what's gonna happen in that building over the next few years. But for that building to be used most effectively, we need to keep praying. Because this isn't a building project, though we have to do some building work. It isn't a community project, though we very much hope it will be of benefit to the community. But this is a mission project. This is about us as Beverly Baptist Church knowing Jesus and making him known. And so Jesus needs to be at the heart of what we do. So we're just going to spend a bit of time now in prayer relating to the Armstrong's building and what might happen through it. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you again for this opportunity. We thank you for everything that has come together to give us the use of this space for a time, we hope a long time, for your kingdom in Beverly. As we continue to discuss the best use of the building and the changes we need to make to facilitate that, we pray that you will be in those discussions, that you'll be in the practical outworkings, that we can get the necessary alterations completed quickly and to a good quality and within the budget that we've set aside. But all that is a means to an end, that we might have a space that we can occupy, a space where we can welcome others to come in and to share with us. 
And so we pray for our ongoing use of that space as a church. May it be a place of worship, a place that is full of your Holy Spirit. May there be a sense in that building of entering into a worshipping community, of coming into the presence of God. Lord, we pray that it would be a welcoming space where people would feel at home. We pray that we would be a welcoming people and that you would be working on us if there's any edges that need to be rubbed off to enable us to welcome all who come into that space. Lord, give us opportunities going forward for interaction between church and community in that place. That people would not just come in, do whatever they're doing in a physical building and leave again. But they would encounter us, your people. But they would encounter you. That it would be a place where people find Jesus. Lord, I've said this before, it's the it's the continual challenge on my heart in coming up six years now in Beverly that we haven't seen people coming in from the community into the community of faith. Lord, may this building be a space where that can happen. A place where people will come to know Jesus, will come to faith in him. A place where people will be baptised. A place where we may all grow together in our faith in you by the power of your spirit. May we be able to look back, as we can look back now and see how you've been guiding us to this point. May we be able to look back in a few years time and give thanks for all that you have done and see how your hand has continued to guide us, to lead us, to transform us, that we might be an effective witness for you and the means through which your kingdom might come in Beverly and wider afield. So Lord, we ask your blessing on this project and all that it will mean, not, not so that we look good and it looks like it succeeds, but so that your name might be praised and glorified through us. And so we offer to you this building and we offer ourselves and all that we are. Take us, use us, change us, empower us, that we might know you more deeply, that we might follow you more nearly, and that we might make you known more clearly to a world that needs, needs you more now than ever. Hear these prayers, Lord, we ask. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're continuing our Lent series looking at the letter of 1 Peter. I'm going to read for us from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 to 10. As you come to him, the living stone... Rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone 
and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Lord, we thank you for your word. And we thank you for Steph, who is going to come to speak to us about this passage now. And as she opens up to us more of what it means to have our identity in Jesus. May your Holy Spirit be at work to challenge, to comfort, to encourage. And may your word for us be heard clearly through what Steph has to say. For your name's sake. Amen. Isn't it interesting um, that I, in recent years there's been um, a whole host of programmes and websites that encourage us to uh, investigate our ancestry and our, and our family heritage. And it, it, it seems to have been um, become a, a, a thing that's become increasingly popular. And um, I think one of the originators of, of this exploration it was the BBC programme, Who Do You Think You Are? And that's been going for a number of years um, and was sort of a forerunner. Um, and I, I personally find it a fascinating programme. They take somebody who is well known in our society today and take them on a journey it, into their, uh, their, their family's past. And usually they um, investigate one or two key members of the family uh, and find out a bit about their life. And um, at the end of the programme, the person who's doing, gone on that family journey has, uh, has an opportunity to reflect on what they've learned. And very often, um, they, in their reflection, um, maybe refer to one or two people who, who they really resonate with and are really identified with. And um, maybe it's something about that person who did a similar thing. For example, maybe they were an actor or they were very creative and the person uh, talking um, is an actor or a creative. Or it might be that they've been really impressed and, and proud of that family, past family member because of how they've managed to negotiate adversity or stand up against injustice or um, something else that's been that's obviously made profound impact on that individual. And it's really interesting that quite frequently um, uh, different people will say how that has impacted how they then see themselves and um, in some instances it's also been influential on how they then choose to live their lives going forwards as a result of the knowledge of where they've come from. And um, it seems to, these programmes seem to tap into this, um, this deep um, uh, heart cry almost of, uh, of, of humanity to, to get to understand who they are and where they've come from. And it seems to be kind of this yearning and this desire seems to be um, kind of um, in, in prevalent in, in lots of cultures. So in different cultures, I think, probably come to terms with in, and investigate it in different ways. Some cultures revere and, and even worship um, ancestors and stay linked with their heritage and, their, and understand and their identity um, in, in that way. And in our culture, perhaps we are... Um, um, we, we, we don't express ourselves in, so, in, that, in, in that way so much, but there's still that deep-rooted desire to understand where we've come from. 
And, and I suppose if we look at it from a, a Christian perspective, that's not surprising because right way back in the book of Genesis, right at the beginning, Genesis talks about God creating all of creation and then creating this distinct um, uh, group of creatures human beings who um, are distinct in that, that they are the only uh, creatures in God's creation who are made in the image of God. And there's something about being made in the image of God that is really um, um, uh, uh, important in these particular crea uh, creatures having a real distinct role in um, in God's creation and it's almost that God is saying you have got to you go and um, re-image me, me in in the rest of creation you go and um, recreate um, my image um, um, on, on my behalf and there's that sense of God and humanity doing this in partnership and you know um, in the early kind of uh, chapters uh, Genesis describes God and Adam and Eve walking in the call of the day and there's this sense of relationship and them getting their sense of identity from their, that relationship with their creator, their heaven, their father. Um, but then um, Genesis goes on to talk about how um, having been given this role to play and this distinct identity, humanity then chooses not to place its identity in who they've been created to be and the role that they've been given, but they choose to go and find their identity in something else, in themselves, um, and they uh, find their purpose in being in, in driven in being driven in um, in trying to find a sense of identity in what they do. Um, and it's so it's 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 not surprising then coming back to now that people are still trying to figure out who they are if we look at that this whole phenomenon through a Christian lens and um, uh, this sense of really wanting to know who we are really helps us orientate what we do um, in our world and in our life um, so um and and um we and we try and find our sense of identity in in maybe our career our marriage our children our possessions it could be in sex it could be in drugs it could be um and so we're living in this um now in this state of having a, an image that he a, a, an image that is marred by our culture our society maybe our, our family dynamic and our family history and um, maybe um through some of the choices that we've uh, and our lifestyle choices so this this um this this group of create this part of creation that's created to reflect god god's glory has has lost its sense of identity and i think this is what uh, peter is tackling in these verses when he's working and talking about um talking to this group of people who are going through this really extreme um, situation and he's kind of reorientating them back uh, into a, a really se a clear sense of identity because people who have a clear sense of identity and who they are um, are, are I think much, are much more able to withstand the shocks of life and because they're rooted in in something solid and from a Christian perspective, that solidity can only come from um, from the, the Creator, from God. And I, Peter's drawing that, um, the, the, his readers' attention to that in the passage, the passage we're about to look at in one Peter two, four to ten. And interesting, rightly from the beginning of verse four, he is really clear where that identity should be anchored. And he's saying, he says, um, and he's saying that it's up to us. We, we, can, we can approach the living stone. And it's very clear that the living, in his mind, the living stone is Jesus Christ. Um, Jesus Christ, who's rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to God. 
So in that, even in that space there, he's using an image that I think he's very comfortable with, that sense of a stone. Um, why? Because actually, it's, I think he's even calling back to the illustrations of who his personal identity is in Christ, um, because it's that very kind of um, idea, that very image that Jesus um, called Peter to be when he first met him. So if you look at the story in John where Jesus and Peter first meet, Jesus looks at um, Peter, who's called Simon at that point, really um, intently. And he says, um, your name's Simon, but I'm going to call you Cephas, which is in Aramaic, it means the, the rock. Now, at that particular time, I think for the people who knew Peter, they must have thought Jesus was being, you know, having a bit of a laugh. Because um, if you read some of the, the gospel stories of, of who Peter is, it's quite... Um, clear that P Peter at that particular point when Peter first it first meets Jesus is, is quite flaky and impetuous and yet Jesus looks at Peter and sees something of his real identity and names that right at the, almost at the beginning of their relationship and indeed when you look further on in Peter's story into Acts you begin to see that that rock-like um, uh, his personality really starts to come to the fore and he is one of the leading lights of the early church. And it's this same man who's using this imagery right now as he's talking to these people in crisis. Um, and it's interesting that he, he, he then says, you know, Jesus is the solid rock. It's not me. I know Jesus called me the rock, but actually I'm only the rock because of who I am in Jesus, because I, I did, my, identify, my identity is solidly in Jesus. And um, you are likewise, um, I, um, I like you, I'm a living stone. And if I'm a living stone, I'm also therefore chosen and precious to God. And um, that's where our identity people is. So he's re reminding them of that. And it also then goes on to say, your living stone's been built into a spiritual house. Now here, he's not just saying this, your identity is in Jesus, but he's also saying your her heritage goes way back because by being taking your identity in Jesus and, and following how Jesus um, images God, um, you can be made into uh, the temple. The temple that was ref is referred to in the Old Testament was a physical building, but now God's pre that's where God's presence was. Now God's presence is in the midst of you. And it's not in the midst of one person because God yet again is a God of community. So just as Adam and Eve walked in the call of the day with God back way back in Genesis, God's chosen people are called to walk, walk with him and become something um, where he uh, and become a, 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 a group of people who inhabit and who can hold the presence of God. So um, he, Peter is saying, look, you have this heritage and it's linked way back there. It's always been God's intention to have a group of people that display and that can inhabit and, 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 and walk with him in the call of the day and, and um, uh, be a people who can live in, in, in God's presence because he wants to be with you. Um, and then he goes on to say, and you're a, a, again links back um, into the heritage of Israel and says, look, that um, you are not just um, a living temple now, a living spiritual house um, there to hold the presence of God and uh, allow people to come to God because of who you are as a community. You're also a holy priesthood. So you're called also to, to, to show what the image of God looks like um, in the whole of creation by living a distinct life. And he says, he kind of uses that whole imagery of the priesthood, which comes from the Old Testament and which his readers would have clearly understood about because the priests were um, a distinct group of people within God's chosen people, Israel, and it was the 
priest's job to keep saying to the people of Israel, this is what the image of God looks like, be like this. And that was part of their job was to keep the, the people of Israel on track, as it were. But it was also their role to be um, the people who, 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 who kept um, God's, uh, a sense of God's justice and human dignity. And God did that in a very specific um, way in the context of the Old Testament where the culture was very different. But um, so although um, how God worked out his image in that culture at that time might now be different to the um, to the people Peter is talking to, Peter's still saying the principle is the same. You're still called to live a distinct life and you're still called to understand your identity and image God out into the world. Um, and he keeps reinforcing this heritage and, the, and who Jesus is and therefore who those people are in Jesus throughout the rest of the, the, the verses, through the verses that follow. And he does that by referencing the Old Testament. Um, he does the, references the Old Testament three times and picks out three distinct characteristics of who, who God and Jesus are. Um, a, 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 again, to re-emphasise the, the people of God's identity at this present time. So he, he, in verse 6, he quotes Isaiah 28, verse 16, and he, and he quotes, See, I lay a stone in Zion, which is obviously Jerusalem, the holy place, a chosen and precious cornerstone. Now, let's, look, he's used the same language, chosen and precious. But now, rather than it being the living stone, this cornerstone. And it's this cornerstone. And the, the cornerstone, don't forget, is, is, is a key piece of, um, of holding a building or an arch up. And um, so it's the, it's, the, it's the really important part of a building. So if... These people have been built into a spiritual house. Jesus is the cornerstone of that spiritual house. And because he's the cornerstone and the cornerstone is fitted firmly, that house will not fall. So even if you are going through really challenging circumstances, you, will, you can stand firm because the, ha the temple won't fall on you people. It won't. Um, he, it, Jesus will be a true um, and solid now as he was back um, in the in the times of old and um, Jesus is indeed the person that Isaiah was prophesying about so Peter's making link lots of links with um, with the with the with the the people of God now to the people of God in the past and then he moves on in um, verse 7 and he quotes Psalm 118 and again he's also reinforcing here um, that some people will distinctly very definitely choose to reject their identity in Jesus and and in, and, and he, he says so the stone that the builders reject has become the cornerstone and that stone will cause people to stumble and, a, and, and it'll be a rock that makes them fall so in this specific situation, um, that when he's talking about rejection and people who choose not to believe, it, this is very, he's, he's, in the Greek, if you look at the Greek, it, it's a very definite um, a point that Peter's making here. So those people who really have, have seen what it means to have an identity in Jesus and then firmly reject him, then um, that kind of, they will constant, they, they will, they won't ha be able to find their true identity and self and, self and sense of self in anything other than Jesus. That will become a stumbling block, but, but they there have made a very clear decision to choose uh, not to follow Jesus. But you have made a very clear choice to follow Jesus and therefore your identity is wrapped up in in who Jesus is and he he, he like he bangs home the point again it by quoting Psalm 118 because it's the same psalm Jesus quotes about himself to some of the Pharisees who were 
um, rejectors of who Jesus was and they couldn't accept that Jesus was who he said he was. And Jesus uses Psalm 118 and the Jewish um, people who knew the, who knew the Old Testament, the, the Hebraic Bible, they would have understood the significance of quoting Psalm 118 because it was a, a passage that Israel used to sing in procession as they followed a king, as that king was about to be anointed and take his throne. So Jesus was very definitely identifying himself with um, taking on the role of being a king which would have been quite shocking to the people he said it to at the time but then Peter reuses that imagery again um, in this uh, passage but he's also interestingly quotes it in, in Acts as well in one of his first speeches where he says this is who Jesus is he's a he's a he's a kingly priest so again he's saying to the people um in his day, you are priests and you are regal and it may not feel like the rest of the world sees you as that, but that is who you are. That's who your identity is, is in and that's what your identity it looks like in the world around you. And his final kind of link with the Old Testament is actually right at the end um, of, of our passage today in verse 10. And he quotes Hosea and Hosea 22, 23. And... Um, once you were not a people, but now you are a people. That's your identity. You are a people. You're a people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So there's that sense of go back and remember who God is and how much he loves you and how merciful he is, he is to, towards you. But also in quoting Hosea, he's also underlining how solid God is and how solid it is to remain, to have your identity in, in God through Christ. Because Hosea is one of those prophets whose whole life was a living illustration of how God was, wanted, to, wanted to relate to his chosen people. As Hosea was asked to marry someone who was serially unfaithful and he knew right from the beginning of the marriage that was going to be the case and yet all the way through the book he's called over and over again to love his wife, love and love and love and love despite her unfaithfulness. And it's almost like Peter is using that quote to say, "You are um, God is has been is the same consistent loving God that He was back there, and He is now, despite your circumstances. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you, and and He's faithful to you. He's faithful to you." And he rounds this whole thing off, does Peter, um, by banging home yet again, um, very clearly who um, these people, what, who, where their identity is in, in God. And he, in verse 9, nine says, but you are a chosen people. Even though it might feel like you've been abandoned, God has chosen you and you are a royal priesthood. You have this distinct identity that, that God has given you. Um, um, you are a holy nation, God's special possession. And in that identity, you can then find out what God is, we be reminded of who, what God has called you to do. He's not just giving you this identity to kind of like go off and do your own thing and have a, have a but he, there's a purpose. You have a purpose. You don't just have an identity. You have a purpose. And that purpose is to declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into light and in that the whole living of life and um back in verse five being this holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices which is your day-to-day -day life choosing to live um in in in, with, in jesus and follow jesus um in that day-to-day -day li living sacrificially um and living in your identity you in in your in that in that in that just day-to-day -day being um, uh, exhibit God's image and that he uses the image of the, um, God's wonderful light so as you receive God's wonderful light you re-image that and reflect that light out into wider society and so he, Peter's constantly calling this, these people back to this is who you are, this is who you are, and therefore this is how you should be, and this is how you are, this is, this is what you are anyway, this is how you do be, as it were, in the situation you're in. 
and um, um, it, it's it's it, once he and in that context he then goes on in the rest of Peter to talk about what that um, the distinctives of that lifestyle actually practically looks like in 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 their context in that time so we'll go on and maybe explore that in the coming weeks but for us right now um, I find that uh, this uh, interesting to um, maybe take that role of that person who's just come to the end of their journey and who do you think you are and to reflect back on what they've learnt about their history and their heritage and see how that might impact how we then choose to um, mull over our identity and how that works out in how we live going forwards. And I think that's a, uh, that may be a particularly pertinent conversation to have within ourselves and with one another at, at this particular time in our life at BBC. As we take on um, the Armstrong's building, something that we as a community have never done before, we've never managed um, a physical space before, um, how can that physical space help us um, better continue to be built into a spiritual house which holds God's presence. Um, I'm not just talking about the physical space, I'm talking about how can that help resource us to be continue to be built into a spiritual house. How um, does be, having the Armstrong's building, how do we work out being a royal priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices in that context? And, and also more importantly, in the wider context of, of, of how our wider society then grapples with the after effects of lockdowns and the COVID pandemic. And um, because in the coming months and um, to, in the coming months uh, not only we as a community but we as a society will have to reassess our identity who do we think we are in the light of the year that's just gone and I think that we probably we as the people of God have something to say um, into that situation and in our specific context we have something to reflect back into the um, the town of Beverly and the 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 area around Armstrong's, um, and um, it will be interesting to see in these coming months how we uh, live in our identity and um, how we um, how we reflect being a chosen people and a royal priesthood and a holy nation and God's special possession. And it will be interesting to see um, in this current, cha in these changing circumstances going forwards, how we then declare the praises of him who've called us, who's called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. And, um, and how we can then, in the, in the knowledge of our identity in Jesus, how we can help um, effectively re-image that out into the places uh, God has, has called us to be uh, in this present time. As we were pulling this service together earlier this week, there was one obvious song that jumped out from the passage we read. And so we're going to close our service reminding ourselves of the identity and the hope that we have in Jesus, our cornerstone. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness, Christ alone, cornerstone.
Thank you to all those who have been involved in this morning's service. Thank you to Steph. Thank you to Julie and Phil for the music and Phil also edited this week's video. I look forward to seeing Beverly Baptist regulars on Zoom for coffee in a few minutes and our children and young people before that for a chance to catch up. But as we close this part of our worship, I just want to read again one verse from today's passage to commission us as we go out into the world. You are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You are God's special possession. So go and declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Amen.